welcome Amanda and Ronay to the Ethical Evolution. Thanks so much. So happy to be here with you both. Thanks, Bindi. Now, uh, you're both back by popular demand and how lucky am I uh, to have you both back here. Um, so we'll start uh, with you, uh, Amanda, if you want to uh, tell us who you are, what you do and uh, the work that you do. Hey, I'm Amanda Mackay and I'm a sound healer. So I use many different instruments in my sound healing work that helps to dissipate uh, static emotions in the field or the body of my clients and the goal with that is so that their nervous system is really calm and they get to uh, be more relaxed in their everyday life in the decisions that they make and the interactions that they have with other people. Yes, and, and I know that full well because we've been working together nearly two years and I'm a completely different person. Um, years? Oh, wow. Nearly two years, yeah. Wow. yeah. And uh, Dr. Renee, if you'd like to tell us who you are and what you do. Um, I am a clinical psychologist. Um, I work with the largely dual diagnosis population. Um, I'm a trauma specialist. Um, I... Um, and the CEO of two different companies, um, one being a standalone private detoxification for uh, drug and alcohol, and the other being a wraparound concierge program that um, establishes connections from national and international lines, um, having treatment teams wrap around their clients for their individual needs and based on who they are as a unique person. Yes, and uh, also you recently uh, were on the podcast and I, and I think the world tilted that day uh, uh, when we recorded. So, uh, yes, uh, I've seen um, some of the incredible work that you've done and um, we're so lucky to have you with us today. Um, now, we're talking about music as a healer today um, and I have invited you both. Actually, no, I haven't invited you both. You were both chosen, <laughs> not by me, um, but, uh, you were chosen uh, to be here today, uh, because of the, con the connection that you have with me and also, uh, you know, what, how sound and music plays a part in your life. So there's so much that we can talk about today. Obviously, um, this is a huge topic, but, um, like I said, you're both uh, experts in your field and that's why you're here. So, Amanda, can you explain how sound healing works? Okay, so when I use a sound instrument, whether it's a singing bowl or a tuning fork, a drum or even my own voice, that vibration meets with a dissonant emotion that's sitting in the field around the body or actually in the body. And the body recognises the beautiful tone in the drum or the tuning fork or the voice and naturally brings it in towards it. So it moves through the dissonant emotion. And just like water over uh, a sugar cube, it, it melts it away. So that dissonant emotion then dissipates and the body then can absorb all that beautiful vibration from the uh, instrument. And that brings a calm to the central nervous system. Yeah. So that's how that, that essentially works. Yeah. And so if we, we look at that in a little bit more detail and the instruments that you use, do you want to take us through some of those? Okay. Well, the tuning forks there are different kinds. You can have unweighted and weighted tuning forks. So we'd use a weighted tuning fork more on the body to help the body release the stress that's around that emotion. They can also be used in the field. And then we use the unweighted tuning forks in the field. So different hertz are good for different emotions or different organs also. So there are thousands of tuning forks that you can use for different organs in the body, bones, different tissues, all sorts of things. Uh, I use a lot of uh, the same forks. I have a lot and I go back to the same ones all the time. So there's like a five to eight hertz, which is really good for DNA. So we, uh, most of who we think we are or we 
lived through in our life is inherited emotions, inherited belief systems, inherited thought patterns. So that that fork helps to uh, change those inherited beliefs. So then when we're clearer, we actually then can understand who we are more rather than those inherited uh, ways of doing things. Uh, you would use a, a 174 hertz for more work on the body. And then I love using forks for the heart. So the heart is the centre that I work with the most. I have found over the years that heart coherence is uh, the most important thing when I'm working with people. So we can work on lots of other chakras, but it's really the heart healing that I have found the most important. Yeah, and I, I can absolutely vouch for that because I've been through your eight-week uh, heart coherence and uh, absolutely life-changing. Um, so aside from those, um, obviously a, another big part um, of the, the instruments that you use is obviously singing bowls um, and um, absolutely magical. Um, you've got a whole range of those as well. Yes, I have crystal bowls and then I have the Tibetan bowls as well. Yep. So they're generally tuned to a specific chakra. Mm. Um, so that, that all of the main chakras are usually the ones that people uh, buy, but also there are a range of singing bowls that I've just come across and they're gorgeous handcrafted bowls from Japan and they will actually match the vibration that's specifically needed for each person. Oh, so wow. this is a, it's just, you could spend forever <laughs> just looking and, and tuning into bowls and using all different things. They, they're really lovely, lovely yeah. tunes because they balance you where you need it. Mm. And obviously uh, you've got gongs, you've got drums, um, you use the, the small kind of uh, shamanic type drums as well. Yes, the drum is probably my most favourite thing. Yep. Because I use that with my voice as well. Mm. And that seems to be the healing that is really the deepest for people. Mm. If you think the drum and the voice are the, our two most primal things, we have a heartbeat. Mm. And when we're babies, we're in the womb with our mother's heartbeat. So that's our first encounter of that rhythm, yep. of that beat. So when we're working with the drum and the voice as well, it resonates in a way that nothing else seems to with sound healing. It's very, very deep. Yeah. And, and it's I, transformative. Yeah. I know in, uh, in healings with you, when the drum comes out, you're going for the big guns. I am. <laughs> it's when like, oh. Today, it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> And I, I remember a particular experience because um, I've suffered with back pain for, for many years, as you know, and I, I get off the table and you've just got this worried look at me and I'm <laughs> in absolute pain with my back. You get the drum out and it's gone. And yeah. like nothing else clears that like that does. It's incredible. Yeah, so our, if we want to have a look at why that is, yes. it's because our back is our support. Mm. So when we're not feeling supported in some way, the drum is getting to that real basic family structure, society, community, feeling supported. So it's, it's helping to move those emotions that are stuck with you that may not be yours even, mm. where you haven't felt that. Yeah, so true. And, but guess what, Amanda? Guess what? No more back pain. <laughs> that's so good to hear we'll come back to you in a sec now um dr renee any thoughts on that experience with amanda i mean it's absolutely um i, I think it's otherworldly um to be honest i think it's tapping into something that's so much greater than ourselves yet is at the core and the essence of who we are as human beings and we talk about the drum and the heartbeat and the womb and all of those, you know, uh, experiences that are, you know, pre-life, pre-verbal. Um, you know, as a psychologist, you know, it's, it's something that is 
um, explored sometimes with certain therapists, other therapists, you know, are, are not comfortable, you know, discussing or, or going into those kinds of realms. Um, but when you really think about it, you know, you're tapping into something that's so much higher and so, you know, so much of our, our higher selves, and yet it's the most intrinsic and the most, as Amanda was saying earlier, you know, in it's in our DNA. So of course it makes sense that the body would be resonating with um, something that's as natural as breathing. You know, it's, uh, it's, 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 that, it's as, nat as natural as oxygen, you know? Um, and my work, you know, although I, I'm not a sound dealer and it's not something that I'm trained in, um, I have enormous, enormous value um, for the role that it's played in the lives of my clients. And, you know, as, as we discussed in, in previous, you know, um, and in our previous podcast, also just, you know, pre, you know, previous conversations, you and I, Bindi, you know, yeah. you know that I, I love incorporating teams um, and there's nothing more rewarding for me than when um, someone like Amanda can get into what I would call like the back door, mm -hmm. you know, where it's not even something that we, it, it's beyond consciousness. It's beyond something that we're even, you know, uh, cognitively, you know, executive functioning wise aware of. Um, it's tapping into something, it's tapping into a part of our healing where our body just releases something. Um, and we don't even understand always how it happens. Um, but I've seen it, I've experienced it, I know it to be true. Um, and, uh, and like I said, you know, it's, it, it's both so, it's both so great and, and so enormous in, in terms of its capacity. It's, it's so, um, uh, it's so, I, I hate to use the word magical because it makes it sound like, you know, it's, it's, you know, uh, light and mirrors, you know, or smoke and mirrors rather. But, um, you know, the, the reality is, is that it's, it's like, as Amanda was saying, it's, it's, it's going back to, you know, something as intrinsic to ourselves as the heartbeat and, um, and literally looking at ourselves as cell by cell on a cellular level how we are connected to ourselves, how we are connected to the universe. Um, and of course, to sound, you know, sound waves, vibration, all of that makes, makes perfect sense to me in terms of how the brain works and in terms of how healing works. Yeah. And um, Amanda and I were actually just talking off air before about how um, this, this skates so closely with science and it, it really is, um, very detailed down to, you know, um, you know, sine waves and, and, um, hertz and things like that. Um, but yeah, we were talking about vibration basically and, and its impacts down to a cellular level and, and what it actually does. So that example I gave of my back, um, no doubt that the vibration from that drum does something on a cellular level as well. Um, which is a, a physiological response. Mm -hmm. So um, looking at something like that, I mean, there's, there's no doubt in science that this, this actually works um, and, and living proof right here. Um, but when we actually look at those brainwave states, um, you know, there's, there's so much that we can leverage there as well. So uh, when we're trying to, you know, get into that, that inner part of people um, and, and get those walls down, um, you know, do you both want to share um, your views on, on brainwave states and how uh, you use them in your work? Absolutely. Amanda, why don't you go first and then I will, I'll follow up with how I, how, how I um, am so aware and, and so um, grateful for the way that's shown up in the healing of my clients. Okay. So the brain wave that mostly comes in my healing is the delta because it's with the drum beat so it's that very primal uh, beat that most people are resonating with when i do the healings we also then go into theater theater more when i'm using bowls and forks uh, that's more your meditation light sleep state so uh, that's sort of when people are feeling a little bit drifty but they're still conscious of what's going on in the room. Um, sometimes they have memories come back, even though we're not actually talking because 
it's a sound therapy, it's not a talk therapy. So we're not actually uh, working in the ways that uh, Renee would work with her clients. Uh, so that's mainly the level that I'm working at because everybody's in a really relaxed state when they're working with me. So that's more my experience with the different brain waves with people. And they will feel like they've had the best sleep of their life when they're, when they're getting off the table. They feel really rejuvenated. Because like I said before, it's the central nervous system that's really responding to the, to the sound and the vibration. So I'll hand over to you, Doctor. <laughs> Um, my experience um, with, uh, with brainwave and brainwave therapy um, really taps into my work with neurofeedback, um, which is similar to uh, biofeedback, but it's uh, oftentimes it's called EEG biofeedback, um, which literally means that we're working with brainwaves um, to help create um, a pattern, I think to help not, not, not to influence a pattern uh, within the brain that is done through sound um, so that the brain can literally practice um, going into different states, um, uh, from different, different frequency waves that are associated with um, their desired outcome. So, um, you know, beta, which is, you know, definitely um, essential in terms of being alert and being attentive. Um, oftentimes helping uh, our clients uh, through the process of neurofeedback, which just to describe very, very simplistically and briefly um, is where uh, there are sensors that are placed on the outside of the scalp. Um, your brain waves are read in real time um, by a mechanism that is uh, very attuned uh, to your brain waves and your brain, brain waves only. Um, and it provides um, a series of sounds for you to listen to um, that um, basically guide your brain waves into different frequency patterns. Um, and over time, let's say if your desire is to focus uh, better, um, you will practice going into a beta state um, over and over again, um, being led there by um, the practice of you interacting with uh, you being yourself in your normal state and uh, practicing um, exercising almost like the body, you know, the brain exercising almost as a muscle, um, you know, strengthening those neural pathways that are responsible for focus. Um, in my work as a trauma specialist, um, the theta state um, is one that um, we utilize most for healing. Um, in those moments, like exactly as you described in Amanda, where it's kind of like almost like a waking sleep, you know, you're there, you're in a very relaxed state, uh, you're not asleep, but you are, um, you are very relaxed and you are very um, open and receptive to, um, you know, different memories that may come back, releasing of different memories that you may be storing. Um, what we know in terms of the work that we have done uh, with neurofeedback um, and with particularly uh, working with clients in the alpha theta brainwave state um, is that we have a tremendous amount of study um, that has been done um, for the alleviation of post-traumatic stress disorder, um, which first began uh, only being utilized with veterans um, and then having seen enormous results, evidence-based and scientific results um, that proved that the elimination or the vast decrease in symptoms um, of post-traumatic stress disorder in veterans um, led to the development of utilizing this modality with clients who have who are suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder and high levels of anxiety um, all across the board. So I was first introduced to it as clinical director back in 2009 here in the US. Um, the studies were done uh, in the late uh, 90s, um, but it did not actually gain enough popularity or traction within the treatment world 
um, for it to be utilized on a larger scale. And now I'm very, very proud to say um, that it has become much more mainstream in terms of the treatment community, in terms of the treatment world, as a modality that many more have learned about and researched. Um, and when we talk about things that are evidence-based, uh, I mean, the, the evidence with our veterans has shown, and certainly in my own personal experience with clients has shown, that there is a, um, an enormous decrease um, in the uh, symptomology of post-traumatic stress disorder, of anxiety held on a cellular level within the body, um, and medications actually that um, were prescribed for the specific purpose of alleviating those symptoms um, were, act were actually proven far less effective um, than neurofeedback and having the brain body connection um, again, you know, that, that brain stem where we store our trauma, um, go into the practice of releasing that trauma and really going into that brain state of, I can be relaxed and I can feel safe in this state, allowing the brain and the body um, to release trauma that is stored um, without having to discuss it without having to, again, you know, although talking is part of the work I do, uh, obviously, um, in this work, it is not about talking. It is about the relationship between one's brain and one's body to the sound that is creating a relationship uh, and a physiological change within the brain where new neural pathways open and it allows for healing to process in a way that um, merely talk therapy cannot. Um, and in fact, as a trauma specialist, um, what the treatment community, community can often fa uh, fail to recognize is that the um, discussing of trauma in detail um, over and over again, um, the verbalization of uh, re-exploring and reopening what those specific traumas were and reliving them um, can actually be very counterintuitive um, and can actually cause the body to re-experience and the brain to re-experience that trauma as if it were occurring today. So having these modalities and no, having the knowledge of these modalities that um, again can create such powerful healing um, and really allow the brain and the body to release trauma stored that may or may not even be of the client's conscious awareness, um, but they simply feel more peace. They simply feel less anxiety. They feel the release and the relief of trauma, of flashbacks, of nightmares. Um, they experience better sleep. Um, and what we can see actually, because we are actually able to read the um, brainwave data, um, there's nothing more scientific than that, right? And we actually see the brain wave formations change and we watch the brain be able to learn um, over time and over repatterning itself, um, how to place itself into those states to the point where it becomes natural and, it, and neurofeedback is no longer needed um, as a modality any longer because the brain has indeed actually learned to self-regulate and go into those states that provide peace and that provide alleviation of anxiety. Um, and we actually are able to tr see and track um, through, the, uh, through the appearance of the brain waves um, that we're able to see in real time and that we're able to look back on um, the changes within that person's brain um, on a truly scientific level. That's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And, and yeah, just, I'm, I'm going to say it blows my mind. <laughs> Bad joke. Um, <laughs> so um, no doubt you both have seen um, such transformation in people just through healing um, using sound or sound waves of, of some kind. Um, and, um, I know Amanda, you and I have spoken at, about this at length, um, for, for a long time. Um, do you want to share some of, uh, the transformation examples you've seen in people 
uh, through the sound healing work you do? The, the experiences have been quite varied, actually. I, like I said, we work on sound. We don't walk, work with talk therapy, and I don't uh, tell people that I can heal anything physical either, although it may be a manifestation of the emotions that they're holding. I can't say I can fix a particular thing. However, I have seen, like you were saying, with the back pain, healing people sending me emails giving me feedback that so their knee that had been troubling them for decades was a lot freer and they could walk better and that particular feedback was from a man who was in his 60s so he'd had this pain for a long time but with releasing the emotions the physical healed as well and anxiety is a really common thing that people uh, come along with and releasing uh, emotions in the body and you actually putting the tuning forks or the singing bowl on the body so the body can absorb that vibration into those muscles and the connective tissues actually releases it as well. So people have actually looked physically taller when they're leaving, which is incredible and they can breathe better and everything just expands more the lungs and they can take a full breath they can get into a better yoga pose so there's some of the great things that come along with some of the healings um, people being able to manage their relationships and their communications differently because they're not holding on to the emotion and that vi they're not giving out that vibration when they're entering into communications. So the vibration is not coming back to them, like the magnet. Mm. So when that has dissipated, they feel like they're not having those uh, disconnected or dissonant sort of communications with people because they just don't have the expectation even that the communication is going to go a certain way and we're talking mostly with family here mm -hmm. you, know, <laughs> you expect to go along and this is what's going to happen and so and so is going to say that and that changes in in their body and in their consciousness which is the energy around the body so they're having easier relationships work gets easier you know colleagues or the boss might not annoy them <laughs> in the same ways because they haven't got those emotions sitting in the body. So if somebody goes, you know, it, I'm sure a lot of people who work in service industries get a lot of people coming in and they're cranky and they're taking out their day on that person because they're expecting bad service wherever they go. So they're actually creating mm. situations that probably actually aren't even existing. I had to wait two minutes mm. or they got served before me. They're actually looking for the confrontation because that's what's sitting with them. So when the sound can dissipate that, even those simple interactions, going to the petrol station, whatever it is, sitting in traffic doesn't tend to bother you anymore. If you just enjoy the music that you've got on the radio or listen to a podcast or whatever it is. So it just generally makes everything a lot clearer and more enjoyable, which is what life needs to be about. Yeah. And again, I can totally vouch uh, for that, Amanda. It sounded like you were telling my story actually, but um, <laughs> you, just don't, you don't react in the same way anymore absolutely changes everything mm. yeah you have a lot more patience mm. with other people and i'm not so angry <laughs> no <laughs> people are still scared of me but i'm not not as angry anymore yeah <laughs> so there's a lot of different benefits from reducing the vibration in your sound and your field and you can see you can see that other people's reactions are just that they're just reactions it's yeah. not personal either mm. 
yeah it's a it's a whole new way of looking at the world and it's it's life changing absolutely life changing sorry renee you were going to say something yeah i I just got really uh inspired by um what uh amanda was saying about you know needing to find more joy in the world and uh, it just reminded just immediately gave me this this uh this flashback memory um uh, my mother, who's also a psychologist, and I, um, we work together at times as, as a team. Um, there are times when, you know, she will work with one member of a family, and I will work with another. And um, because we, like we have discussed, you know, we go where the clients need us. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a relatively long distance. And, um, you know, just talking about the power of music and sound. And as you were saying, Amanda, you know, what if you could just listen to the radio or a podcast or whatnot? Um, I remember sitting with uh, my mother, um, Dr. DeSiena, in traffic. And, um, and I mean, it was just bumper to bumper. And we were not going to go anywhere. And uh, for those of you who have ever driven in Los Angeles, California, if one lane of that freeway is closed, um, you are going to be sitting there for a very long time. And she would begin to see me kind of squirm and get a little frustrated and look at my, you know, look at my watch and, you know, oh God, oh God. And she, you know, and she would say to me, you know, of course, after making the responsible uh, decision to let our client know there was absolutely no way that we could avoid you know, being as late as we might be, might be. Um, my mother actually uh, began carrying these egg shakers in the car. And when we would get stuck in traffic, she would give me an egg shaker and she would put on music and she would say, it's time for a dance party. <laughs> time for a dance party right here in the car. No time like a dance party. And so she would literally break my thought pattern, you know, and have me laugh at the experience that there's nowhere to go. It's not as though the frustration is going to make things move along any quicker. And she, she literally would laugh with me and say, it looks like the universe just gave us an opportunity for a dance party right here in the car. And so she'd put on, you know, she'd put on this very like groovy music and we each have an egg shaker in our hand and she would, you know, sing and I would sing. We'd shake the egg shaker into the point where, you know, we were basically our own little duo sitting there in the car. And the fact that we were late and all the stress of that and, you know, oh my goodness. And I can't believe believe this and you know we left so early and how is it that we're all of that just kind of dissipated and we were in the moment and I was just with my mother who's also one of my dearest friends in the entire world um we looked at it instead as an opportunity to have some of the favorite memories of you know laughing and and singing and just taking a moment that the universe gave us and said well I don't know what you had planned for your day but that's actually not what's going to happen. So you might as well make the best of this moment. And, and, you know, we're, um, you know, we can talk a little bit later about where music, you know, has made such an impact in my life, but that's a, that's a total uh, example of where music just enters the picture in my life and says, we're going to change your mind state. We're going, we're going to change, we're, we're, we're going to change your, your brain pattern. We're going to change the mood that you're in time for a mood shift. Yeah. And, and, um, and so, as you said that, you know, just, you know, embracing the joy and, and, you know, you know, if what you bring with you, you know, into the picture, what you bring with, what your expectation is of that day to continue the message and continue to the, the, the self-talk of, well, today's ruined and, you know, I, now I'm late and oh my goodness. And now this person's going to think I'm irresponsible. And, you know, just because we're healers doesn't mean we're not human. And we also have to, again, you know, take care of ourselves and look at where our brain patterns are going and where we're taking responsibility for the universe, you know, um, every, everything, right? We're supposed to be able to handle it all, right? So traffic included, I'm supposed to be able to, you know, clear the freeway and, you know, get exactly where I need to go and, 
uh, you know, just the idea where music can just slip into that and, and the gratitude that I have that, you know, that's, that's, that's one of, you know, one of my personal influence and in, influences in my life is my mother, um, who continually reminds me, um, through music, through laughter, through, uh, many things that she shares with both me and our clients, but, um, with me as a daughter, uh, of how to, you know, change your mind state by allowing yourself to be in the present moment and how, you know, having a dance party in a car as opposed to focusing on minute by minute, just how much later you are going to be, um, really does, does change the way you're going to see the rest of your day. Yeah. And um, just to leapfrog off that, Ronay, um, uh, since, since you and I met, um, obviously music is, has been a huge part of, of our connection and um, to the point where every day we share a song with each other and there's usually a meaning behind that and it, and it shifts our whole day um, and, and the energy of it to the point where we've now got a global collaborative playlist <laughs> that uh, is, hey, that song, that song today, you know. So, um, and, and that, uh, you know, 11,000 kilometres apart uh, has made that connection just disappear. You know, like, like there's nothing between us. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm. The, the way that we are able to communicate um, through music, you know, the, the way that we're able to say so much um, with a song. And um, I think I've talked to you about this, Benji, but, you know, um, I, you know, I work on not having my phone be my alarm. Mm. Talk, about, talk about sound again, um, following some of my own advice. Um, I learned that having my phone be my alarm system meant that I would look at my phone and every time I would look at my phone, uh, I would look at it as something alarming. I would look at it as something that, okay, everything drops, must pay attention. Um, and of course, you know, because we're both visual and, you know, you know, if you're, you know, visual, you know, if you have visual capability, when you're looking at your alarm and it's going off on your phone, you're also seeing messages, messages simultaneously coming in on your phone at the same time. So the first thing you actually see and you're aware of from the time that you're awoken by the sound of your alarm, if you're looking at your phone, is for me, uh, a plethora of messages that have come in during the night while I'm asleep, you name it. And so um, I actually found an old fashioned alarm clock and my phone is across the room. And once I give myself the moment to wake up for a second and not use my phone as an, as an alarm, um, I uh, walk over to my phone and I turn it on. And what has happened for me, Bindi, I don't know how, you know, at what point in time, or I guess I've never asked you this question, um, but for me, um, what happens is I literally give you um, total stream of consciousness, the first song that comes to my mind that day. Yeah. Um, I often wake up with a song in my heart or a song in my mind, and I don't even know necessarily why it's there. And I don't, I don't overthink it. I just immediately share it with you. This is the song that is in my mind right now. This is the song that, you know, this is the song that I immediately thought of today. And I don't search through songs to say, oh, you know, what's a song that I'd like to represent today? Or what yeah. is a song that it just, it literally is something that I'm tapping into and I just give you stream of consciousness. This is a song that's in my mind right now. And it's sometimes not until many hours, days later that I come to recognize that that song um, and listening to that song and being in the presence of mind for that song to, to be what I woke up to and sharing it with you. And then you also impacting me by sharing your song with me affected the outcome of my day um that it was you know i was think i was thinking of my song for a particular reason and you were thinking of your song for a particular reason and not only were we having a conversation but it led it led me down a different path of my day um not only because we were sharing songs and music but because the idea of connection 
which was our initial podcast, mm. uh, connecting through music, things that words alone cannot say, um, what can be conveyed in a song, in a tone, even, you know, music with no lyrics, you know, mm. music yeah. without, without any voice whatsoever. Um, the ability to communicate a feeling, the mm. ability to communicate a mindset and mind state from all the miles between us. Um, you know, it's this experience of feeling this closeness in our friendship, this closeness in our connection that has developed and I believe has been strengthened so much by this idea of just something as simple but as sacred as sharing this, these, these, these musical messages mm -hmm. with each other. Yeah. You know? And um, I think um, I've, I think one of the things I actually said to you was that I became more conscious of what I was listening to and mm -hmm. I wasn't listening to noise anymore. Um, so um, I, what I listen to now is very different to what I used to listen to, can I just say? And, and I think, uh, Amanda, you and I have also had this discussion before, um, you know, what you listen to, you absorb. Um, so, you know, I, I think we had a joke on your podcast about, um, you know, Metallica might not be your choice, but, um, <laughs> you know, oh, actually, <laughs> yeah, you know, so um, what you listen to does actually impact you, um, you know, down to listening to the radio and, and all the ads and the noise and the, you know, the stuff in it down to podcasts and which ones you listen to, ones that have a mission and, and a meaning rather than just noise. Like uh, n this has impact. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, it does. I haven't watched commercial news for decades. Mm. No news is good news, right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't like the negative, and I didn't want it around my children either when they were young. So they absorb it when they're playing on the floor in front of the TV, and I didn't want that around them. So I just turned it off. And yeah. haven't turned it back on. And I really enjoy that. And I don't, I do listen to really good podcasts rather than commercial radio too. Mm. And I find a lot of songs that you listen to have a particular vibration that I don't want in my field either. Mm. You know, a lot of old songs have uh, ideas that were quite the norm back then, but now. You know, they, they highlight the differences in the way that society has changed and what we accept and what we don't for men, women, roles, genders, all sorts of things. And sometimes I just can't listen to it. It's like, I don't want to hear those things. I don't want that in my consciousness at all. So yeah. I'm very selective with what I listen to, definitely. Yeah, and I um I was just explaining to Ronnie the other night that um, the other day I went for a beach walk and I had our playlist on in my ears as I'm walking along and it was like it was like a movie like it was so uplifting um, but you know imagine that to a completely different soundtrack it would not have been the same experience so um, you know just putting and, and, and even to the structure of my day where there's music at the beginning of the day to, to lift you up, like if you're feeling a bit flat and you're not, you know, on your game, um, one song can change that in a, in a heartbeat, literally. Right, literally in a heartbeat, right, Amanda? <laughs> <laughs> I'm on fire today. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, I, I, I could not agree more. Um, you know, I think that, you know, um, for me in my work, you know, um, sometimes pain and anger and hurt and trauma, uh, need a way out and they, they do, they do need to be voiced. Um, and sometimes music is the way that clients are able to communicate that, um, to me, especially in a safe space, um, with a, in, within a small group of each other. Uh, sharing, this is what I'm feeling today. This is what I'm feeling right now. 
Um, but within that safe space, it's not something that we continue to listen to ad nauseum or go into a, like a scuba dive where you don't come up to breathe. Uh, it's done for the purpose of releasing it. It's done for the purpose of saying, this is what I am holding on to. This is what, this is a part of me right now that I'm carrying and in sharing it and in, it, and, and in kind of giving it away um, and kind of, you know, sharing that this is what's going on with me when I don't necessarily have all the words to say or when the words are too painful um, to say. Um, or I don't exactly know what the words are. I just know that this is the feeling and I need to convey it. Um, being able to convey it and have it dispersed, it's kind of like watching, you know, a laser beam destroy a cancer, you know, like, uh, you know, like destroy, destroy, you know, malignant cells, you know, it just kind of, it just kind of eradicates them. And all of a sudden, this thing that was holding so much power, this thing that was weighting this person down, is now something that's been diffused and now something that's been released and can now be replaced with light and can now be replaced with healing. And so um, there's a place and there's a time, right, for, for all kinds of different music. Um, but. I think what we're all relating to and, and what Amanda was saying, I think is so essential is that, you know, as a sound healer, of course, Amanda is going to be especially aware and in tune with what she is absorbing um, on a cellular level, on an emotional level, um, by the things that she is listening to and by the things that others in her realm are listening to. And it, it's so impactful and it's something that people don't really recognize, you know, how, how often they are being impacted in ways that they are completely not conscious of. You know, there is this, there is this very honed sense that Amanda has of when I listen to this, I am acutely aware of a change that happens within me. And for those that are less aware and for those that are less uh, not to be uh, uh, not, not to be trite, but less in tune with uh, you know what they are, what they are hearing, what they are absorbing. Um, they don't really give it the weight, or or the the they don't have the understanding um, that what they are listening to is a choice, that what they are listening to um, has an impact, and that they have power over changing that impact. Um, they have power over, you know, they can, like Amanda said in her life, choose what she lets in and what she lets out. And, and first comes the awareness and the recognition that that is very real, um, that what we listen to and what we, what we allow in our, in our, in our, you know, field around ourselves is, is, is actually very, very impactful. Um, and that awareness you know, I think is something that um, many of us, you know, can fail to recognize just what's what's going on in the background. You know, um, you, you're, you're walking in and you're, you know, um, in a place and, you know, when restaurants were open, you know, here in Los Angeles, California, um, you know, the news or whatever is going on in the background and you're sitting down, you're having a conversation and you're not, you may not even be aware that, whatever is going on on the news channel that that restaurant or pub or whatever has going on um you're listening to that at some level you know you really are and you find yourself kind of going kind of like listening with your third ear like you're having, trying to have a conversation with a friend but then you hear some sort of horrible thing that's going on on the news and it takes you completely out of the moment of connecting with your friend or what you're there to talk about and all of a sudden you're you're transported to this place where you're filled with fear or worry or concern or whatever's going on and you didn't choose that channel it just happened to be on um, but in our lives quite literally we get to choose our channels. We get to choose our channels, you know, and um, take, take accountability, which comes first from the understanding, 
we have to have a understanding to have accountability that what we listen to and what we allow to impact us is a choice and it's a choice that matters and that affects us and that affects the people around us. It's so true. You, you just um, reminded me of, you took me back to grade nine, can I just say, um, <laughs> where I did an experiment uh, and I played Baroque music while I was studying and I got the highest grades I ever got when I studied listening to Baroque music. Now that's like Vivaldi, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's as a teenager, I was doing that. And so I, I still occasionally put it on if I'm painting or doing something that I really need to concentrate on because it does change the way your brain works, what you listen to going back to those brain waves again, um, you know, it can give us better outcomes in what we do as well. Um, what we're listening to while we're doing something. Amanda, you look like you're biting to say yeah. something. <laughs> they changed um, the basic um, hertz of what they record music with and write music with. That's why that music is completely different. Mm. So really music from the 1950s back will be more relaxing. You'll be able to learn better from the, around the 50s to now, it, they, they changed it. So it's more that uptight, uh, sort of in the music. That's, that's the baseline of all the music that's been made, unless it's classical. Mm at the moment. So all your popular music and all the different genres that are made, it's a completely different vibration now than what it was back then. That's, that's why you can actually learn so well when you're listening. And they've proven that with plants and babies with Mozart and all of those sort of things. So absolutely the vibration that you're absorbing. Yeah. Uh Amanda, I don't know if you're you're familiar. You just said, you know, with babies, and I, you know, I was I was I was bursting to say, well, you were while well, you were talking about, you know, before the '50s and the classical music and learning better. There are absolutely studies that are done on how the brain is actually able to focus better uh, when listening to. Um, classical music and we have something here in the states I don't know if you have it there in Australia um, or if it has the same name um, but under the um, under you know taking that research into account and understanding that learning and listening actually begins in the womb you have what um, you have baby Mozart you have, you know, it's all under kind of this, this, uh, I believe, I, and I don't want to misspeak here, I think it's all under uh, the brand name of Baby Einstein. I could be very wrong about that, but I definitely know that Baby Mozart, Baby, you know, these different, these different classical, uh, these different classical records, these different classical sounds um, are recommended, not only for babies and infants once they're born, and as they are learning in, as they're learning as, as, you know, young children and toddlers, et cetera, but actually recommended for women to, uh, and parents to, to play, to pour their children in the womb. And um, because, of re because of what research has shown, and you will literally, you know, um, there's literally been studies done on watching and listening to through ultrasound, the fetus respond to the music when it is being played. And so once again, going back to science, it's just an absolute, you know, definitive thing that, that sound matters um, even before we take our first breath. Yeah, absolutely right, it does. Uh, you, you're saying the babies absorbing the beautiful sounds from the music. And also, this is where a lot of people first absorb their stress mm. from the, mostly the mum in the womb and not to put any blame on mums either, but we have stresses in our lives and that's, a, that's the first experience we have of some emotions and we can actually be born with those stress states, the same as a baby born with a drug addiction. 
it's the same it's the same thing so we can actually be functioning all our lives with a particular vibration that we've absorbed in the womb similar to the music that you were talking about and we think that's who we are until we start to have things like the uh, therapy that you're talking about with what you're doing and sound healing and you can start to balance those things and understand that that probably wasn't actually you it was a it was an emotion or a vibration you had that set a particular belief system or, or behavior pattern in uh, progress too. Absolutely. And so if the mother is playing this for the, for her uh, baby, the parents are playing this for their, for their unborn child, they're also absorbing those sound waves. Absolutely. And, right? and it's the conversation between the mother and the parent, you know, and their baby, you know, that they're having through music where the mother's body is responding to the music. And so the baby's body is also responding to the mother's body that is responding to the music, yes. you know? And so it's, it's a very, it's, 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 you know, one of the first conversations we can have with our babies, you know, is, is this idea of playing them something that, you know, says you're safe, you're okay. You are, you're loved you know, and um, of course, for many parents out there, uh, one of the things that it also tells you is your baby will be more intelligent if you <laughs> play classical music for them while they're in the room. Um, and uh, I don't know how we how longitudinal those studies are at this time or what proof there are of it, but uh, what proof there is of it, but I can certainly say that a less stressed, less anxious mother and child will make for a better outcome uh, whether it's on an in, in intelligence level or just the ability to absorb the world around them um, without anxiety or trauma or things built in on a cellular level as barriers to their success. Absolutely. Like you said, they feel loved and supported straight up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, look at that, hey? Um, <laughs> now, I wanted to also talk about uh, playing musical instruments. Um, so no doubt, Amanda, that's your every day um, in, in the work that you do. Um, but uh, Ronnie, do you use that in uh, therapy with your clients? Not in the same way that Amanda does. Um, when I am looking for um, an amazing uh, sound healer, which now for clients that I'm working with internationally, um, or even here in the States, I can say, uh, you know, without a doubt, boy, do I have someone for you. Um, because, you know, I always enhance my team by people who I come to know and respect and, and, and vet very carefully and who are the real deal. And, you know, they don't make it into my very small, very close network of experts without um, a lot of uh, my buy-in and, and my, my signing off right behind it um, because I'm exceptionally protective of, of each life that comes into my own and that I have a, um, that I have a place and a, the honor to, to help heal. Um, so now I've met yet another wonderful individual to, to join this uh, tremendous team. Um, of mine. Um, but, you know, in, in the way that, that, that I utilize music um, in, you know, without, you know, without, in, in terms of not sound therapy, um, you know, I, I tend to attract by the work that I do um, individuals that are creative uh, or in need of a creative outlet. Yep. And um, I myself um, am a musician. Um, I, uh, I come from a musical family. Um, I've been aware of the impact of music from a very, very young age. And, um, I really knew that, you know, as I began to get my footing in, in, you know, in terms of my work, that, um, there was just no way that, that music was not going to make its way into, um, the therapeutic setting. 
Um, and so, as I was mentioning before, you know, in terms of group work, in terms of individual work, being able to communicate through song, being able to communicate through the sharing of music um, has been critical to uh, a deeper level of understanding, a deeper level of emotional release, um, things that can't necessarily be expressed in words or are just so much better or more uh, said so much more fully um, with the impact of song behind them. Um, in terms of, you know, playing musical instruments and whatnot, you know, um, it tends to be a tremendous outlet um, for, you know, a big, a big passion of mine um, is helping individuals identify and or reconnect with their passion and their purpose. And, you know, for those that have an interest at any level, um, in the musical experience as an outlet. And it doesn't, it certainly isn't something I would force on them. Not on, not all people are, you know, like I said, it's a highly unique program and based on truly who each individual is. Um, I tend to find, however, that many of the clients that are drawn to this work are either musically inclined um, or certainly, you know, with encouragement um, will, will want an outlet for their emotion and they will channel that energy into a guitar into the keys of the piano into voice into whatever instrument of their choosing might be and um thinking about it now and i hadn't actually thought in these ways before but i don't think yet um that i've had a client who has done this that is not personally connected with their instrument um, to the point of naming it. Um, they, they've each given them names, um, which, something, which is something that just occurred to me now. Um, I don't believe that there's a single client that I've worked with that has not named their instrument something. And that is the ownership. That is the level of emotional investment and and the part of them an extension of themselves and and their emotional experience that this instrument comes to represent and it really isn't about becoming the best guitarist ever or the best pianist ever it's really about finding a way of expression and it's about literally you know the kinesthetic uh, approach to, you know, feeling the guitar strings or the violin bow or your fingers interacting with the keyboard, the keys of a piano, and you are impacting something. You are creating sound and, you know, you are, you are interacting with something bigger than you. Every time that you just strum a guitar, um, you're creating a vibration mm -hmm. that exists all around you. And so when you think about that and you think about the idea of even just simply just strumming a very, very simple song and what that does to self-soothe, what that does to express, what that does to, you know, channel what is going on within and have a way of experiencing it. Um, it's, it's almost like looking into a mirror uh, of what's going on inside of yourself, that you, you are putting a part of you into this, this instrument. This, this, you, are, you are creating a sound that you can hear coming back at you and saying, this, this is you. This is, your, this is your emotional statement. This is what you're creating. This is what's going on for you right now. And um, it's a very healing, it's a very healing process. It's a very healing process. And I feel incredibly, incredibly honored um, to have had songs shared with me um, because it's really a letter written from the soul. Mm. Whatever it is, whatever that song is, it, whatever that mind state was um, in real time, whether it's with whether it's whatever that is, um, I'm being given a very sacred message when someone shares a song with me 
um, either that they've heard and that really impacts them and they, and they just say, I really needed you to listen to this today. Um, but there's also an incredible experience of watching a client of mine embrace an instrument and, and actually, um, like I mentioned in naming it, you know, it becomes an extension of the self and it becomes a way to channel emotion um, in a way that is um, healing, in a way that is contained, in a way that is uh, a release. Um, there, there's just, there, there's so much, there's so much to that, you know? And so that I get to be a witness to that and encouragement behind that work um, is, is really a gift for me. Yeah, and uh, Renee also gets the gift of seeing me play guitar and piano. Um, <laughs> um, but but I have to say, um, when for me, uh, when I play a musical instrument, um, there's, it's almost like there's a bit of a high um, that you get from it, um, particularly when you've nailed it, you know? Like, it's like, yeah. Um, so when you learn something new, you, you, you know, create a new song, whatever it is, there's, there's a real high in that as a creator um, that you just want to keep returning to. And for example, I'm now using it as, as a way of dealing with the things around me. Um, for example, last night, my neighbours were having a party and instead of yelling at them, I shut the door and I picked up the guitar. <laughs> so much more healthy way of dealing with it. <laughs> You can't beat them and join them, right? They're partying, you party too, you know, yeah. in your own way, well, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And Amanda, your instruments obviously are very different to the um, standard guitar and piano, um, but no doubt um, the, the impacts uh, it has for you are huge. Yeah, what is very interesting is I never did very well in music at school. <laughs> and I was told that I was very average at singing and now I actually use instruments and voice in every interaction that I have with clients mm -hmm. and it's something that I always really loved I could actually pick up uh, music quite easily outside of the school environment and it was something that was quite a big part of my life so I actually transformed my own belief systems about being told that I couldn't and now it's exactly what I do. So look at you go. <laughs> but what's, what's, in, what's incredible about that when I hear that through my lens, Amanda, is that the way in which they were trying to contain and lead and control your gifts were was not working for you it, it that was not the way in which you were going to be set free that was not the way in which you were going to um appreciate learn absorb music there was something going wrong in that dynamic where you know it didn't resonate in that way for you then that had to do with the way in which it was introduced perhaps the judgment behind it it needs to sound like this it should be said you know whoever the individual was whatever the modality of teaching was there is a way that we can teach someone right out of their intuition that we can teach someone right out of what resonates for them and we can say no 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 it ought to look like this it ought to sound like this. And um, we can give individuals real performance anxiety and really take, strip them away of really, you know, intuitive and natural gifts by putting our own judgment on them. Um, we do it to, we, we, unfortunately it happens a, a lot, um, you know, in, in many different fields, but, you know, you know, the idea of anything artistic and creative, you know, we have such, um, there, there's so much power in the hands of our instructors and our leaders to, uh, to help us become more in tune with ourselves and more free in our expression or to really teach us how to shut down and how, and, and to believe that we're, we're not 
good enough because it didn't sound like what they wanted it to or that the feedback coming back at us was so um you know negative or judgmental or or or, you know strict um that it just didn't feel right and it just didn't resonate and you know there are a lot of people that i know that gave up piano or that gave up singing or that gave up guitar at a very young age because they had instructors who really didn't know how to unlock the gift from within. Um, they didn't know how to allow the, the play, the interplay of the person and, and the music and the expression. They, they were very, they delivered a message in a way that said, um, it's not right. And, and you're, you're, not, you're not good. And you, you, you may never be good. I don't actually think that, that this is meant for you. And it's, it's incredible to, 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 to witness someone in, later on in life recognize and, and, and come to terms with the idea that that actually had nothing to do with them whatsoever. Um, that their innate gifts were waiting the entire time and the real teacher was themselves, not the person that was trying to direct that or control that in the way that they wanted to. That's absolutely right, every word. <laughs> absolutely right. Uh, in those learning environments can be far too limiting for cre- the creative expression. Yeah. And just lastly, it takes me back to a conversation that uh, Rone and I had the other night where we were talking about our inner child. And um, Amanda, you and I have done work in this area previously as well. And I think um, allowing our inner child to be creative and play and be free, I think is really important um, for us to be able to embrace the, the power of music and sound um, to transform our life. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, you know, I, uh, just on a personal note, you know, when I, uh, when I said I was a musician, I, I, um, actually since beginning our conversations, Bindi, I found myself, you know, singing out loud and, you know, um, singing in, you know, to you, uh, over the, over, <laughs> over the phone. <laughs> I think it was at some ungodly hour, uh, and I just said, "Oh, you know, I just, I just started. I said, oh gosh, I want to wake up the neighbors.' Um, and uh, I just, I, I just started singing to you. Um, you know, it, the idea, the idea that you know we really do have this, this expression that's just bubbling over inside, and as adults, we, we seek some time to shut that down. That, that adulthood means um, not allowing." that freedom of expression, not playing, not, you know, if you're going to pick up an instrument, it's because you're going to be, uh, you know, if you're not going to be the next, you know, uh, Led Zeppelin, then put it down, you know, Um, rather than, you know, in that moment, you know, be Robert Plant, you know, be Freddie Mercury, be Janis Joplin, you know, Um, in that moment, transcend anything, be who you want to be, be your own rock star, because you are, you know, and, and, and so the idea, though, that we shut that part of ourselves down where, you know, as children, we can go around air guitaring, you know, like nobody's business and having all this fun. And as adults, we say, you know, that that internal voice of, oh, man, if I'm not, just, it's not right. And they, we get frustrated with the outcome as opposed to what it's supposed to be, which is truly it's called playing, playing an instrument. You know, um, and, you know, for me, as you said, you know, going back to ninth grade and I guess, you know, I guess my mother is really in my universe today. I mean, she is, she is in my life a lot. Um, but the, the idea that, you know, her voice, when it comes to this, when it comes to uh, finding my voice, really. Um, and I guess I... Oh. Well, no apologies for 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 cheering up, right? Uh, it's um, it's very real for me. Um, uh, my mother, um, since the time that I was a young child, um, always stopped to hear what I had to say, and my mother always wanted to hear me sing whatever I wanted to sing, 
And, you know, as I grew older, um, there were individuals in my life who were very influential in directing me toward what would have been a musical career. Um, and it might have been a grand one, um, but I needed to do a lot of inner healing work before I could be in any sort of vulnerable position about what that would look like to, um, in the professional musician world, um, devote myself to meeting the goals and standards and look and, and um, really the ownership that and now I experienced that through the lives of many of my clients. Uh, but, you know, uh, my mother was very, you know, aware of who I was as a person and, and how I would respond to living inside of that box um, and, and really, you know, cautioned me that she would support whatever I did, but to understand truly the impact of taking something that you love and um, having it be in the hands completely, almost entirely of, of someone else. Um, the, the goals that they set, the agenda that they set, you know, all of it. Um, and that was then, and uh, you know, you, people have all kinds of different musical experiences now, or they're their own producers, they're their own labels, they're their own. That was not the experience back then. But one of the first things that happened before, you know, really having the discussion about what becoming a professional vocalist or be, what, be, what becoming a professional musician might do and the negative impacts that, that might have at a time in my life when I really had not done the healing work I needed to do to stand in my own power and stand in my own voice and say, I'm not going to go this direction. I'm going to go in this one. Um, my mother never, you know, there was, there were, there were vocal, there were vocal exercises, you know, going up and down the scales and whatnot. Um, but my mother never wanted me to have classical voice training um, in the way that, you know, um, in, in the way that others may have suggested that I should. Um, the, the being on pitch, understanding, uh, understanding tone, all of that, yeah, absolutely. But when it came to be, when it came to be tra trained as a as a classic vocalist, um, my mother really, it, you know, influenced me in another direction, and said, you know, when that happens, uh, oftentimes you lose your voice, and you train yourself to sound a certain way. And I never want for you, especially in fighting so hard um, to find your voice, Rane, to find your voice in life, not just in your singing, but your literally your voice to have that transformed or changed by another individual or by another set of individuals. I want you to be you and I want you to sound like you. And it's something that in so many ways I carry through my therapeutic work into my message to clients. Um, it's, you know, it really is, you know, my, my voice box is my instrument, right? And so it, it's really a it was really a matter of me understanding um, the power that that voice holds, the way in which I direct it, the choice I have over the power that I, you know, it, the way in which I use it, uh, the words that I say or sing and why they matter. Um, and I so appreciate that in the most loving of ways and, 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 and you know, fully explaining to me her rationale behind it. Um, that my mother really stood in the way of me trying to or being led in the direction of sounding like the latest pop star and instead sounding like Rane. And to this day, when I 
impact the lives of others because I am so in tune with my own voice and I refuse to give it up for any reason. I remember that it all started with not being part of that concept of morphing into what the popular choice was of, of literally, you know, staying, literally owning my voice and not signing it away to anyone. Um, and, and that is, that's one of the most powerful musical and life lessons that has come out of my love of music um, and my desire to help heal. And um, without a firm belief and understanding in your own voice, you really can't help other people find their own. And I owe a lot of that to the confidence that was held in me and the, 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 the teaching that I had. Um, the belief in me as a person uh, and the encouragement of me to look within for the answers, not mold myself to the popular opinion. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. Amanda, you're glowing. You're absolutely glowing. <laughs> I'm loving listening to the story because I'm resonating with what Ren Renee is saying in that story as well. Mm. As 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 a daughter and as a mother mm. and the gift that she gave you was just beautiful yeah yeah and for everybody who receives your help it's such a gift oh, thank you amanda i i you know the um i feel the exact same way about those that have the honor and the privilege of knowing you I mean, it's, uh, it's, we're all, we're all, uh, we're all mothers in some way. We're all reparenting constantly parts of ourselves for those who have children, parenting our children, but our clients in some ways, they're, they're a little inner child too, you know, and, and to have that knowledge of how to hold and encourage and and be the wind at your back you know um it's it's a tremendous gift it's a tremendous gift to be able to hold the trust and the hearts of our clients um in our hands and it's a, it's a tremendous privilege that they give us to be allowed to do so you know, especially, you know, in the work that, you know, we do, you know, that I do when I do nonverbal work, especially in the work that you do, like what we were talking about earlier, that just goes right for the DNA and the cellular level and things that just, you know, bypass all of that, you know, um, conscious thinking of, you know, you know, what, what is, what is this that's happening right now? What is she doing with that fork? What is it, you know, it just bypasses all of that and it gets down to the heart of the matter. You know, um, that was a Don Henley reference, uh, actually. Uh, yeah, but it gets right down to the heart of the matter, you know, and it, it really does. And you, you know, you're just able to bypass all of the barriers and, and fear that people have of letting go, um, of identifying their pain, their anxiety, their weight, their, their sorrow as, as parts of themselves. And then to actually have the trust in your hands to, to witness it fade away in a way that they don't even necessarily on a conscious level know how you did it, but that they trust you enough to do it and to keep coming back for you to do it again and again. And if that is not mothering, caretaking, holding the inner child, the soul, the essence of a person, I don't know what else is, you know? And so that's, um, you know, I, I always said, you know, I'm a vessel for the work that I do, you know? 
and I think you're you're a vessel for for sound. You're a vessel for music. You know, music works through you in you. You know, it's it's something that you that you harness. It's something that you hone and and you're so skilled at. But you're 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 a vessel. You know, for something so much greater, and that you know, just to hold that trust in our hands and to know that we get the privilege of being vessels to something that is my my opinion of music anyway is that it's a living breathing thing i actually think that music in and of itself sound in and of itself for me is a life force it's a living breathing thing and for that to live and breathe and exist um and impact through us how lucky are we um to not only be recipients of that gift but to have the honor and the privilege of, of having others trust us to do that with them. I always feel like it is an honor and a privilege that yeah. somebody trusts me for their transformation. Yeah. And it really does fill my heart to see people transform. Yeah, it's a privilege. Oh, I don't know if you can feel that, but... Um... <laughs> talking about gifts i i have the two greatest ones here and um yeah i, I couldn't be a, a more lucky person right now um I, I can't thank you both enough um I, th I think the world tilted a little bit more again today um because <laughs> two powerhouses like yourselves have come together and it just played out like i thought it would <laughs> um so amanda ronay thank you so much again for being a part of uh, music as a healer on this special edition of the ethical evolution thank you so much for having me and thank you for introducing me to this beautiful powerhouse that is your uh that is part of your arsenal and uh anybody who has helped you be the amazing incredible impactful person that you are already had all of my respect walking into this situation, but to actually have met you, Amanda, from across the many miles, I can feel you and I can sense um, the depth of what you offer others. And I'm so great, I'm so grateful to you, Bindi, for including me um, in, in this beautiful connection. Um, because I'm I'm honored to be included with someone um, like Amanda and like yourself as we do this work. I really am. So thank you so much for for seeing ahead um, that this was a that this was a connection that needed to be made. I listened to your podcast episode and I felt privileged to be included in this also because the work that you do, I think, is extraordinary. The concierge service that you offer for people, I think, is so unique. And uh, I really, I actually felt the impact of it when I was listening to the podcast. So thank you so much, Bindi, for inviting me along and allowing me to connect with Renee too, because it's just beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>